Hey, this is Mark Patterson back again with another episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, um, I continue to get these these amazing guests. And this guy is Steve Azar. And Steve Azar is a guy I've known for a long time. I got to know him back in the day when I played for the New Orleans Saints. And he used to play up at LSU, rock and roll, and, uh, you know, just went along the the uh, the music path of of trying to make it and play cover songs and whatnot and then he finally decided to go back to his roots uh being from and raised in mississippi uh to nashville he started writing country bluesy rocky type music and he finally hit it and this guy's been in the music business now for a long time he's had some huge hits uh waiting on joe I don't have to be me till Monday, sunshine, soldier's song. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And what we do is we actually uh, talk about a lot of these different songs, what was going on at that time of his life. And then he actually plays these songs. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like a storyteller VH1 uh, podcast, which I've not done. And uh, I can't even tell you, as I was listening to this guy, Steve, longtime buddy, the hair on the back of my neck was literally standing up and I just wanted to, to jump in and, and, uh, you know, start singing along. And those are the type of songs that he has. So, uh, on that note, it's just a fun, it's, it's a little bit longer, but bear with it. And, uh, you really enjoy it and you'll be inspired by his music, his songs, his lyrics, and, uh, and really enjoy it. Okay. So here we go. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mark Patterson, back with another exciting episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, I'm so fired up because uh, I have a guy I've known for a long time back when I played for the Saints, that is down in New Orleans. Uh, We used to road trip up to LSU and go watch a buddy of mine, Brian Carey's, uh, now wife's brother, Steve Azar, who uh, later would become, as, as he is today, a country music star. And I am so excited to uh, have, have seen this growth over the years. And, um, and so I want to welcome you to the show. Steve, how are you doing? Hello, Mark. Good to see you. Uh, and not in your uniform, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I know it's better on your body right now at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I'm lucky because of uh, all the, those hits and, you know, with all the, the, the concussion type stuff that's going on, you know, I was, I was able to survive that and, and hopefully knock on wood and, and yeah. uh, maybe that's the reason why I'm doing some of these podcasts. We'll actually remember some of the things yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. going way back. But but no, you know, uh, it, it's it's been really amazing for me to see you, and it's always fun to see our friends, you know, that that grow and become successful. And and um, you know, the name of this podcast, of course, is Finding Your Summit about overcoming adversity. And and so I think a lot of times, just like people uh, used to look at me and go, you know, it looks so easy, and you're out there and you're catching touchdowns and and whatnot, and they had no idea what it took to get to this, these different places. And you know, that the music industry is a very, very difficult place. There are millions of people all over the world that would love to be in your space, um, in terms of being a working, it's almost like being a working actor, right? You're a, a, a working music. And really what it gets down to is you're following your passion. And I've seen you on stage, um, and, and I can see that up there and it's just so infectious to watch that. So, uh, where does that come from in terms of, you know, where, where you, you, know, you go back to your childhood and by the way, I'm talking to you in Greenville, Mississippi. Yeah. I'm back home. That's yeah. I've been here for six years. Uh, moved. I did the opposite of the Clampets. I moved our family from the top of the mountain in Franklin, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, down back to the Mississippi Delta. And, uh, when our oldest son was 15, uh, our middle son, 13, our daughter, 10, ended up going to our same high school. My son, middle son just lit up the basketball court and uh did a lot better than i did and uh, it was fun watching our kids have just really really leaving nashville and coming to the mississippi delta just sort of it was just like it was injected into their being and they really found themselves so uh i'm back home you know one of the things that really comes through in your in your music is talking about the delta right and that we'll talk about that later here about the project you're doing right now but you know what was that about you grew up in a family of five right you got three brothers and two sisters vicky's one of my favorites by the way yeah and um you know so what was that about growing up in greenville mississippi which i've been there which is you know a little dot on the map but the most wonderful people ever that really you know dug into your soul 
Well, you know, uh, I think the best way to explain it is uh, my wife, Gwen, and I started our foundation in 2006, the Steve Azar St. Cecilia Foundation. And we did some events, like we did Sports Challenge for the CMAs, and we had a bunch of your friends, a bunch of NFL past quarterbacks, uh, from Jim McMahon to Steve Berline to Jim Kelly, the Gino Torello, the list went on and on. And they would all come in uh, along with some music buddies of mine, and we would do this crazy sports challenge. And that was really the extent of our foundation. Uh, like I said, the best way to sum up what's what what the magic is down here is this hospitality and old friends and community, a sense of community. We moved back. We started, we, we just, it was like, here we are in this big city. It's a lot easier to get to Nashville than Greenville. It's uh, it would seem we, our foundation would really flourish there, but it really didn't take off till we came here. And I got back to my old friends and, um, uh, and this Southern, very, mystic Southern hospitality that we call the Mississippi Delta, an ethnic hotbed. Um, just, uh, you know, there, we have a documentary coming out uh, off, off the making of our new album called Something in the Water. And besides the art, it's the people. And um, I can't explain to you how, the, how it gave us a sense of purpose and also gave us a desire to really step things up and start giving back to the arts for kids. Uh, our foundation's always been targeted to the Mississippi Delta, even when we were in Nashville. But when we were here, uh, it was just so much easier uh, and more and seeming like a, a step in our life that made us really jump all in. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's just great. You know, there's nothing like going back home, right? And, you know, people yeah. can feel that too, right? And you, right. you, I mean, my sense is that you really stand out. You've been, you know, the governor and the state has recognized you as an ambassador and, and, and things like that. And, you know, and, 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 you know, you can feel that in your soul and you, you move around enough. I, my, my sense is just, that's the, that's the life of a music star. You know, you're right. going to, you're just out here in California and you're all over the United States. And I'm not sure if you go internationally or not. Yeah, yeah I, do. I do. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you know, you're going back to your base, your, your home base and, and, um, you know, it's just a great thing to be, um, you know, quick side story. And I, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but back in the day when I was playing, um, mm-hmm. uh, the saints were doing very well. And this is after a, you know, decades of just, they were the ain'ts. They didn't win a game. I got it. I remember. And, yep. And so there was a roommate of mine, Steve Trapello, who unfortunately passed away, but he was a big offensive lineman from Boston college. And we were invited to go down to this teeny tiny town called Tyler town, Mississippi. And, mm-hmm. uh, they threw a parade for us. And we, li- wow. yeah. And we literally got in this, this, this convertible car. We're going down the street. It was lined with people they were, you know, just begging for us to go over to their house. And we ended up going over to one of the people's houses and we had collard greens and oh, red beans it. and rice and, you know, all it's that stuff, time. right? I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the thing is about here is I, I'm wondering, you know, it's funny. Every I like to shop, I like a grocery store shop. I like to, it's a peaceful time for me. I like, we love to cook. And, um, I think it's so funny because everybody's so used to seeing me. When I first came here, you could see here, you could hear whispers in the aisles and all that. Now they're like all sick of me, you know? So it's been, it's been really good to just sort of blend back in, but, but we're doing good things and with the help of everybody, you know, I get, I get thanked a whole lot from all demographics of ages. Um, uh, it was just, it's amazing, but really to be honest with you, I, I feel like I'm just part of a piece of the puzzle. And, um, you know, a lot of small towns are trying to take them back. You know, there's a lot of people that moved away from here. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough down here. Public schools are tough. And I think the one thing that you can do in small towns like Tyler or Green Bull or whatever is I think that you can uh, insert the arts in people's lives, uh, that, that educational aspect. And when you do, um, it just really seems to impact and, and sort of round off a person, you know, and the arts come in all forms, but down here, you know, Jim Henson and the Muppets, you know, there's BB King, there's Albert King, there's William Alexander Percy. There's, I mean, the list goes on. You know, we play golf with Morgan Freeman. He's down here and he calls bingo every once in a while in Sumner, Mississippi at the Bayou Bend country club. I mean, awesome. God calling <laughs> bingo, you know, no, I'll that- just, it's just crazy. So it is a sense of small town and people appreciate things. I think because it's just so condensed when you get down there. Well, we're going to get into your music here in a second, but one thing yeah. that I really appreciate about what you do is, you know, you're, I, th- I really believe this because I, I didn't think that this was necessarily, I, I don't mean this as any kind of a, a jab or anything, but you know, back in the day when we did come up and watch you in LSU, um, you were this, what I, what I saw up there. And I mean, I remember like it was yesterday, 
it was like, there's this really dynamic performer who loves to sing. I'm not sure if he's in the right lane because you're singing rock and roll. I wasn't in the right lane at all. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and maybe that gets into, you know, your summit and what you had to go through to kind of like oh, break yeah. through. Right. And right. so, and so then years later, when you came out with waiting on Joe and till, till Monday, um, you know, it was just, that's the first time I'd, I'd heard you since that period of time. And I was like, yes, that guy, he nailed it. That's it. That's him. And it, it's just innate to your soul. And wow. it's innate to, you know, now maybe if you grew up in Seattle, like I did, I'd be playing grunge and that'd be innate right, to right, my soul right, or something. But, right. but you know, you're, 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 I mean, it, you're not trying to be somebody you're not. And as, right. as it all turns out, you're really good at what you do. You know, well, he, here's what happened. And here's what, push me back home to the Delta. I struggled fitting in in Nashville because I always had this sort of, once I started to really figure out myself, it was writing, waiting on Joe, which was a song I wrote that I didn't even know was a song. And I was really sort of trying to, trying to get a record deal, but also trying to sort of heal at the time. And, and, and I realized at that point, and, 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 and what were you healing from? I just, just the des just the desperation of trying to finally, um, get to go back out and play live again. He's played 200 dates, but the only way it was going to work out this time was hits on the radio at that point. Yeah. And so I was, as you say, your summit, my summit at that point was the world finally hearing my music. You know, at that point needed a big record label. I needed a lot of a push behind me, you know, to push me up that mountain. And so, um, it was all this writing. I had the best mentors. I mean, my my publishers were songwriter of the decade, songwriter of the year. One guy had wrote What's Forever For when he was 17 years old by himself and up in, up in uh, Bristol, Tennessee. And all of a sudden he has 300 songs recorded a year. These are the guys I ended up working with. And But the only part was they all wanted me to be them, right? And so... The struggle I had was, okay, if it worked for them, I just need to be that. So then I've gone through this whole other thing. So I'm playing the rock and roll, you know, I was influenced by the seventies and eighties. Right. Yep. And then, and then musically I was writing all my own songs, but I was lost, you know, it didn't sound good. And I didn't know my voice at all. And so as I went to Nashville, I continued that process. So you got to realize I didn't have a hit until I was 38. That's impossible these days. You have to be 21, 22. I was 10 years late then. Everybody said it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was just dumb enough, just dumb enough to not think about it and believe it. And trust me, I got the stew beat out of me. But it was looking back, it was so important because I wasn't even country. So as I just started to develop after this, Waiting on Joe was not really a country song at all. It was really more of a, a Mississippi Delta thing. And as I started to find myself, I realized that uh, everybody says I said this, but I didn't. It was in, a, in the newspaper when I was out touring with Bob Seger back in 06, 07. Everybody kept talking about this own version of music called Delta Soul. At that point, I realized that that's who I am. Now, that's a problem because there's no box that it fits in, right? Yep. And so with that, I had to decide. I had to look at my wife and kids, and they just all looked at me and go, hey, do what you do. Because – and so – so moving back home was part of that journey, giving up the big agent, giving up the big management company, giving, I mean, they were big and they thought I was crazy. And I probably was, probably was, but at the end of the day, I've really found this Delta soul thing. And musically now, I only way I can explain it, Mark, is this. When I was 12, I used to, uh, 10, 11, 12, I used to sneak in some blues joints. Now it sounds exactly like that, except coming back home in full circle, having kids, raising kids, um, getting that stew beat out, being at the top of the mountain, falling back down to the bottom, um, still fighting hard as my own, you know, we have our own independent record label in the last four or three, three or four, four releases. Um, I got to tell you, man, now it's that it's not necessary blues. It's not folk. It's not country. It's not rock and roll. It's just a combination of all of it. And uh, it's so easy to write now, and I'm so in tune with what I want to say. And this Steve Azar and the Kingsmen record I, that I did with BB's guys and Elvis and we're Lou gonna Mills. get to that. We're gonna get yeah, to that. Yeah, I know. Well, it, it's sort of here we are. You know what I mean? I'm climbing this mountain. This is a we're not there yet, but this is definitely a, a milestone. Well, you know, it, it's it, it, a lot of people sometimes I think live within their own w realm, right? And the key is is staying authentic to who you are. I can't tell you how many people, especially when I got to 
to, uh, you know, going through the combines and all that stuff in the NFL. Right. I had friends come up to me and say, you will never make it. So, right. you know, it, you, 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 you know, you got to have those blinders on and just like, all you know is you have your eye on the ball and you're not going to take your eye off it. You may have to adjust it, you know, as you go, Exactly. but, exactly. but you just need to stay true to who you are and, and do those daily things to get you to that end point. So, so all right, let me ask you this question. So is uh waiting on Joe. So is that about your brother, Joe? Well, I mean, it was about three, three different Joes, you know, as you know, there's a lot of Joes, <laughs> Joes in my family, right? Yeah. First verse I always picked at Joe for being late and he was always late. And he, I mean, he would be in Memphis and he'd talk to my buddy, Danny. I remember I go, Hey, I'm meet me there. I'm almost there. And we just left Memphis. We're two and a half hours away. And uh-huh. I'm like, you just said, meet you're there, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. but that, that was the Joe time. But really it started to talk about the second verse was about my dream of what I wanted. And I just, I, I felt so close, but so far away. And then in the, you know, tow boats and the Mississippi Delta, which was a big industry. Um, I used to have friends that said, Hey man, if you don't get there in time, it's gone and you miss it. And so I was, I, I started using that as a metaphor. And then my uncle Joe, who was the mayor of Clarksdale, Mississippi, sure. always dreamed of being governor. I was a great man. My mom's brother, you know, he died at 33 of, of cancer and, and ended up at MD Anderson passing away there. And I remember thinking as a boy, Oh, he was old enough. Right. So I'm 33 and 34 years old. And we have, I have a son basically uh, almost the age that, that his son was when he passed away. And I realized, my God, he died as a kid and his, and his didn't get to raise his son. And so the cancer was the metaphor, the train, excuse me, was a metaphor for the cancer. Mm. So there's three verses about nothing. You know, I mean, I don't even know what they were. And I got to be honest with you, I was cutting the grass miserable, right? Trying to figure it out, cutting the grass on a side hill lie that was so steep. If you went backwards or forwards, you'd fall down. I'd slip and fall down every time I had right. to remember to stay focused. It was such a slope. And all of a sudden, the course, it just hit me. You know, I was waiting on you. What well, you let's, let's, let's do that. Let's, yeah. like, would, you, would you mind playing a couple of riffs? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, and then, by the way, this is for, for people who have not heard Steve Azar. Um, this is, uh, I think, your first big hit, right? Second big hit. I okay, we'll get into the, the other hit there in a second. Go, go ahead. But I Don't Have to Be Mean on Monday was sitting on their desk for two years, and then I wrote this, and this is what got it done. Okay. So, I'll do the second verse for you. Okay. And then, of course. Two boats leaving because it don't care. Was not on board, who's not there? One sad whistle blows down the mighty river, it rolls. Man, if I could be more like that, I'd get on with my life and never look back. Instead of waiting on Joe, what do you know? Time flies fast and he is slower than I told him over and over now don't you be late Oh but like always I'm just sitting on gold and waiting on Joe Oh, that was awesome man. I've got these these hairs like have jumped off the back of my neck. <laughs> You don't even know what you just did to me, man. Uh, that's such a beautiful song. But, you know, a lot of times in life, I think we need those triggers that springboard us to that, you know, what was that magical break, right? Well, well, let me tell you what. This is this is the perfect example. Uh, I was a kid, and I was in the, arguably the greatest record label exec in history named Ahmed Erdogan. He signed everybody from Ray Charles to, you know, I mean, you name, you name the act, this guy signed it. He was from Turkey, right? And he owned Atlantic Records, him and his brother. And I was in there and I thought he was going to sign me. I thought this was it. I'd been up there a couple of times and he's sitting at his desk and he plays me the Mark Cohen song, Walking in Memphis. Back then it was cassettes, right? Yeah. And it was Mark talking to him. To um, Hey, I just wrote, you know, it was the work tape. Yeah. And so he plays it for me. And he goes, I'm signing you or him. Who am I signing? That's when it hit me. I go, I've got to be that good. And that's, I'm not even close. And so he goes, he goes, not only is this song, I'm signing this act, this is going to win a Grammy. This is how big it is. Now, here's the deal. I believe you're going to get there. 
I don't know what you are, and I don't think you do either. I do believe you got you've got to stick to your heavily blues background. You know, I think you're sort of country, you're sort of rock and roll, you're sort of folk. You, all these things. He was basically predicting my future. Now, if I'd have had waiting on Joe at the time, he'd, I'd really believe he'd assign me. So, um, but it took me all those years to just get there. And trust me, I'm the guy that made the same mistake over and over because I'm so stubborn. But I think some of those mistakes you make in life over and over actually are just part of the journey. And, and I had to go through them. I couldn't, I couldn't change a thing, you know? Well, you know, the fortunate thing for you too, is that, um, for, again, for people who have not seen you on stage, you've just got this natural energy. I know you're throwing down some coffee right now to, <laughs> to help, you know, fill that it, up yeah. a little bit, but yeah. you know, you're just one of those highly energetic guys on stage and you just love to be up there in that, well, in that it setting. Feels it. The only place I feel absolutely at home is on stage. It's the weird. I if I could explain to you, well, no, you don't. Hey, hey, you don't, you don't need on, in front of car. Crowds. Well, you don't need to because I, uh, you know, I, I travel with UCLA to all the games. You know, Jim going into his sixth year, and so that means right. I'm going into my sixth year, right? And so right. I'm so blessed to be uh, to be asked to 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 go through all that stuff. And and there's no place I feel more at home than going in, in the and field, right? Of, on that field and then locker room and being yeah. with the guys, you know, and just. I get it. Yeah. So you get it. Yeah. So, I get it. so part of that, uh, so I used to, uh, my, my longtime childhood friend, again, we mentioned him before and I'll mention him again, Brian Carey, your brother-in-law now, um, just a music guest. lover. Huh? Music, music lover. He loves music, man. Oh, uh, no. He, yeah. What, what a great guy. And I, uh, we're, we're locker mates at, at our, our golf club in Seattle. And, and what a, what a super guy. But I remember talking to him, you know, always getting the Steve updates as, you know, you're still down the South and I'm moving back to Seattle and in, in LA and whatnot. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I asked him, uh, um, I said, Hey bro, what, what's going on? He, and, and when we were talking about this waiting on Joe album, um, he was talking about this other song that you were just starting to mention. Um, I don't have to be me till Monday. And I was right. like, what is that all about? You know? And so he started to explain, he goes, I'm telling you, this guy's on a roll and he's going to, he, he's on his way. And I'm like, I, I got to hear this song. So, um, tell us a little bit about that song, set that up. Over a lot of Tootsie Rolls, I got to tell you, just started. It was right, right in one other song, and then just also it just flew out of my mouth. The hook, the hook. All my best songs, the songs that have really done well, uh, have been songs with no titles. So I've just started something. I work my way to the title. You know, um, every one of them. So I don't have to be me on Monday waiting on Joe. None of them had titles. Sunshine didn't have a title, although it's a simple title. But it was work. It worked its way to there. And this new album, except for one thing, all the titles were written as I made the journey to it. So I don't have to be me on Monday was just this thing. And we went in the basement with my producer at the time who was, who lived like a vampire with a foil on the windows, woke up at <laughs> literally, literally he woke up at three in the afternoon, yeah. him and his wife. Uh, he was one of the biggest songwriters in history there. And we, he was the guy that really helped me learn how to make my own music on my own. He was really great. His name was Rafe Van Hoy and Rafe and I, and it, to only put it in a simple way is he would he would turn at me after I'd been there with him. I already had a meal, 11 o'clock at night. We've got two kids and one on the way, and he and I've got to get home, right? He turns at 1130 and he turns to me and he goes, hey, how you doing? Like he just woke, like I hadn't been there all day. <laughs> and so I'd deal with that. I'd be up to 3, 4 in the morning trying to get up, but it was in that basement at 11, 12 at night when we recorded everything off of that record. And we've spent zero dollars and his wife was ta from Tasmania, Australia. Yeah. Uh, the drummer, th there was like a band house, and her band was living with him. And the drummer was the Little, Little River Band's uh, keyboard player's son. Yeah. I mean, so it was all these guys. And so I made this this whole album with a bunch of Tasmanians. And one East Tennessee kid named Rave and me. And for some, some way, we were able to capture the Delta. We were able to capture all these things because... They just didn't have the system in place. They they taught me that, hey, we're going to ride shotgun and we're going to tell you when to turn left and right. But this is on you, man. And so that's when it hit me. And I finally had somebody in my life that said this. So Monday became, OK, it's just too important of a story. You got to realize this thing was on record labels, desks. We're going to kick your tire around. I felt like it was a hit, you know? And we had that Mississippi Dells, an old Delta lick that I remembered that we used to do. And sort of a, uh, it was when I was, you know, 14, 15. And all this sort of came together. And um, the song came out 910, the day before 911. It was the most added song on country radio. Right, here we go, right? And my record label president had only given me a singles deal. So the guy wasn't a good guy. 
you know, he was, to be honest with you, he was stoned a lot and he wasn't a good stone. So here I had this guy that's, that's in charge of my life. And, um, and it just, it was, it always concerned me. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So the ball was dropped on his end and it obviously leaked on down for a long time. Well, somehow he realizes, Oh, they, uh, they've got uh he's got, Oh, he had the most added record. It was constant proving. Well, after nine 11 happened the next day, I remember being getting ready to go to Iowa to push the record. Everybody's fired up at the label, all the young guys in the promotion staff who became friends of mine. So they battled with me even beyond his, his, him saying like, you know, Azar, he's not really country, the pain in the tail, you know, he was always saying I was a pain dude. I was too hard to work. So we went out on the road, right? Every week we play four or five different radio stations. We were sleeping two hours a week, waking up in the morning. Uh, and, uh, the song would die every Wednesday. You'd see, because in the music business, your song has to have more spins the following week on Monday than it did before. You lose your bullet is what they call it. Mm. When you lose your bullet twice, the song's dead. This song lost its bullet 11 times. And every Monday, they, every Thursday, they would call and go, the record's dead. Uh, and every Monday, they'd call and go, it's 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 back. So that's and what still happened, Monday. That, that's great. What happened was pe- radio people were taking it literal. They wouldn't play it until Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so we kept increasing spins. And all of a sudden, I remember, we took this road trip through the Midwest. And I bet I visited 30 radio stations, put on 30 shows in five days. And when I came back home, the record, you know, 9-11, the, the sting of it had, had a, a little bit of the edges rubbed off. Uh, it had been six or seven months later, that long, right? And all of a sudden, we found ourselves in the top 20, and then it was over. And it just steamrolled to the top. The only reason it uh, to the top to number two, now, to, to, talking about this is a not a, it, it didn't matter to me that much. But now I look back, the difference in a number two record and number one is there's no party. It's like you climbing the mountain, right? Yep. You get almost to the top. And you just kind of sit there yeah. and you don't get there. <laughs> well, it just happened so, to be in, in, in May on Denali. So I understand that. So, so it's not a good feeling, right? Yep. So we get there and it lives at number two. So I'm between Alan Jackson's drive and George Strait's run. And here we are, my shirt tail out. You know, these guys have cowboy hats and here I am this, you know, yeah. not even close. And so we're battling this thing. And it was the city of Houston. They were mad because they were promised a Shania Twain show and she was on my label, right? No, yeah. I was on her label, I guess is the best way to yeah, say it. Yeah, got it. And so they wouldn't tell me why Houston wasn't playing it, but there were three stations. And in our world, the top 10 markets, it's like, it's like electoral votes. They matter bigger than, so set one spin in Houston, Texas is as much as seven spins in Jackson, Mississippi, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can't make it to the top without them. So they were mad, but they wouldn't tell me. Anyway, long story short, they lived at number two, lived at number two. And then I decided on my own to go see, uh, to go see uh, the guys in Houston. And they were the first station to add Waiting on Joe two weeks early. And they just, if I'd have done that when I knew I needed to, we'd have had number one record probably for four weeks. But um, once again, it was my record guy that he was always sort of trying to, just looking back, I don't have any regret, you know, except... I did have my hand one time in the back of my pocket going, I think it's just time to knock him out. I was like, I got to do it. You know, he had pushed all of my buttons and he <laughs> loved pushing buttons, right? But that's, you know, that's so also what, that you know, sometimes you need, you need obstacles in your way like that, rocks, whatever you want to call them, to push through yeah. and, and to make you want it even more, right? right. To get you really focused right. on, on the end goal. And right. um, so uh, about this song, um, so I built a ranch in Montana uh, outside of Bozeman. Uh, years ago. Right. And, um, and so it was outside, outside of Bozeman, we were about probably 30 miles on this old country road and, you know, just beautiful out there. And, and there's an old whistle stop. And at this whistle stop is population probably six at that time. And we're driving up to this other town called Ringling, Montana. Right. right. And as we're driving up this old road, all of a sudden in the middle of nowhere, couldn't get any radio stations. We kept hitting search, search, search. And all of a sudden we land on this country thing, and here you are singing away. And I had my, my now, unfortunately, ex, but my two daughters and we're all in the car and, you know, they're probably six and eight and we're all singing your song. And it was, it was just a, it was a joyful moment for us. So I would I love, love it. it. I'd love it if yeah. you'd give us a little take on that. I'll do it a little bit right here. Well, I got me a brand new car waiting in the driveway, shining like a bright new star. I've been wishing on it every day. 
to take me away from here. So I called in to where I work, told a little white lie. No, my back don't really hurt. No, no, but that's my alibi. My temporary ticket to anywhere but there. Call it an early weekend. And call it going off the deep end. Call it what you want. I made up my mind. Yeah. I don't have to be me till Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I ain't gonna face reality. A three days without punching a time clock. Three nights ago and non-stop. No work and all play. Well, I don't have to be me till Monday. Went a little bit like that. Oh, I love that, <laughs> man. I might just jump in in a minute, you know? Be your, Come be on your, in. Oh, yeah. Be one of your new background singers. So... Let me ask you this question. Are, are you more of a, 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 a lyricist or uh, the guy writing the music or are you a combo? All happens at one time. I mean, I, I've never been able to just write lyrics or write music. I just, so, so the greatest advice I ever got finally from one of my publishers was, hey, Steve, I'm just so stuck on this line. You get stuck trying to find a rhyme and you do all these things. He goes, hey, what would you say next? Forget it. What would you say next? You're having a conversation with the audience. And that's when it hit me. And then he said, the other great advice was sing it like you say it. And so I used to go, what? And so he goes, everybody, that's how people's ears are tuned. When you, when you write melody and songs, you're singing it like you'd say it. And that's why it's so identifiable. And so those things have stuck with me. When I, when I heard those two things, it took me like two weeks for it to seep in and then it was game on. That's when it happened. And I realized that, you know, that words, if they don't, if they don't sing well, then they're the wrong words. And so it's pretty easy just to throw them out. And, but mil- music and music and uh, words come at the same time. Well, they that, 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 there's no question that's a talent. I mean, I can, I mean, what you just said to me makes sense, but I can't write music, right? And I can't write, you know, Sometimes the words and things. So. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> so no, I just no, stay no. away. <laughs> so, so I, I, I have to tell you, there's a, um, uh, when I get into the kind of the, the, the final, we call it summit day, right? So, you, you you know, it's weeks in terms of preparation of going up and going down and going up and going down and acclimating and trying to get myself. And, and when I finally get to, to, to the point where now I'm going from, you know, the high point of the mountain, like it was down in a year ago in, in Argentina, climbing a mountain called Aconcagua. We're up at 19,500 feet, which is a few feet above uh, where you're at right now, I might add. Um, yeah. and the top was just under 23,000 feet. Right. And, and, um, I've made this playlist and this playlist has got all these songs on it that inspire me, that drive me when I know that I'm at my wits end, all my energy has right. gone away that I just need to have music, fill my soul. And just, you know, in addition to nutrition and, and totally and get it, things like that, I need to keep that going in my ears so I can, I can, it helps me get up the mountain. Right. And, and one of those songs I put on there, it's actually track number four for me, um, is this most beautiful song called Sunshine. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and I just, you know, I, I was just so, um, the words are so beautiful and um, it means a lot to me in a lot of different ways. And, 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 and then on top of all this, you put together one of the most beautiful videos I've ever seen. And it's just, it's just about possibility and about love and about, you know, purpose and, um, you know, the best in people and in a lot of thing relationships. And I don't know, it's just, it, the whole thing is so beautiful that it's just in my, it's so soothing to me when I'm going, you know, and I'm, I'm climbing and, and I also listen to it other times, but you know, I, I want you to know that is on my top playlist. So you know, wow. I, I will ta- take it's- it to the top of Everest. It's sort of a, that's unbelievable. That makes, that means so much to me. And the funny, the funny thing is it's sort of, uh, it has this sort of hypnotic thing. So, so let me tell you where I was in my life at that point. This is a really, this was a tough time. So, so, uh, so waiting on Joe came out in 2002. That yeah, album, 2001. Probably? 2001. Yeah, okay. 2001. So now now, yeah, you got You got to realize I was like one of the poster childs for Napster. People were showing up at our shows, but a lot of college kids had bought into into waiting on Joe, right? Yeah. So they, when the video came out with Morgan Freeman, it obviously put me on, really helped me put on the map. And 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 there were other songs on my record people were drawn to. So we were showing up at places, and all the all the club owners and concerts people were going like, "These people aren't our people." 
right? So I decide I got to go see what's going on here because we're not selling tickets until the night up, right? And it's packed. You can't get in. And everybody's singing every word to everything. Well, what happened was that was the year my album of all the times for it to come out. It came out at the beginning of Napster, and I finally decided to go to a a, a bunch of fraternity guys' apartment that they invited me, and they go, well, this is where we're getting your music. And I went, oh, my gosh. So you got to realize it's like foreign at this point. Yeah. And so anyway, I got sent to Washington, D.C. Uh, my album was one of the most illegally downloaded records of the year. Um, and I was going like, you got to be kidding me. You waited this long for this, you know? So so I, I overcome that. I overcome uh, during that period of tr- chasing uh, radio, which was so important that I went and saw everybody, I developed a cyst on my throat. So the cyst got so big when I would sneeze or I do anything, it would it rupture. And what year so, was this? This was 2003 and four and okay. five. Okay. So I'm, cause what happened was, uh, our record label Mercury went up for sale. So I was on the road at the point doing shows with Brad Paisley, uh, Keith Urban at times and Rascal Flatts and me, we were, we were CMTs, you know, they, there was some show that they put us on that we were going out and doing shows and we were killing it. Um, and so everybody was talking about this Delta style of music. So we were the only ones really doing something that was so unique and, uh, and a pretty, pretty wild show. You know, we were like intense and the band was great. My drummer was from Rome, Italy. I mean, it was, it wasn't some country thing you've ever seen. Right. So we were, but, but we were sticking out and people were getting it. Well, I get a call from uh, the record label president. He couldn't wait to tell me you could hear it in his voice. Hey, uh, here's the deal. Uh, we were going to go six deep on you, but now we're up for sale. So you need to go just go write another record. We'll see you in a, a year or two. What, yeah. That's what happened. And so everybody always goes, what happened? And, uh, so, so for you, once again, it's like, once again, I've got right. to like read ignite. Right. I remember laying in bed for two weeks. I couldn't get out of bed because we were, it was done. The game was on. We had the songs we needed to go deep. So here's what happened. So all of a sudden, I have throat surgery in 2005, right? I've won over another A&R guy, another A&R guy, because my head guy kept thinking, he kept firing the guys that kept liking me. And I, I'm not the only guy that, that that was targeted toward. But I kept winning over all these people who were really, I struggled to even get meetings with for 10 years. And now I've passed, you know, I've gone through all these stages and I've won them over. So I've won everybody over, right? So then he goes, I'm just not going to do it anymore. That's what I had. So I walked in and said, I want out of my deal. So he got, he let me out of my deal. In the meanwhile, I was making all of this music upstairs in my house. Cause I'd learned, you know, being in the, from, you know, the late nights with Ray, I'd learned how to do it myself. And now for the first time, the music was all me. I had nobody riding shotgun, but for myself, this was the most important, the most important time in my life musically that led me to today. All right. So all of a sudden, uh, I get a call from my agent saying that you're going to, you've been, you've been offered the first seven dates of the Bob Seger tour. And I went starting in in Michigan in Grand Rapids and I go, you gotta be kidding me. So I go, but he said, you're only getting seven dates because Eric church who's on fire right now. Yeah. Eric church has, he's a capital act as well. And he's going to have the next seven plus 46 or 53 shows. Okay. So I go out there and the place is going crazy. But before they went crazy, I get off the bus. I'd been listening to jazz all day, right? And I'm in. I'm watching the Food Network, and I go in there to do sound check. And that's when I started writing Sunshine because I like to write at sound check. So it just fell out. And so it was my sound check song in Grand Rapids the first night of the tour. And I remember Bob asking four nights in, "Didn't weren't you writing that, or, or was it? It was Don Brewer who was the drummer. Mm-hmm. He was also the drummer in Grand Funk, and he was Bob's drummer right. in the Silver Bullet Man." And he goes, hey, didn't I hear you writing that? On, weren't you writing that the other day and you're playing it already? And I said, well, that's I like to do that, you know. So he goes, that takes a lot of guts. And I'm going like, why? You know, so anyway, we spent we were off the tour and my publicist calls and goes, hey, Bob's writing about you. The Pittsburgh Gazette just said he's talking about you and my opening act, Steve Azar, how we grew up playing a lot live. And uh, and so uh, and he thinks you're still with him. And so I'm going like, there's no way. All of a sudden I get a call and said he wanted me to do the next 47 shows. Oh, that's great. So, so I start playing sunshine at these shows because it's working and we come out of the, we come out of the, uh, off the road in, in April and we go right in the studio. We set up, we stand up, we play this live and we record it because we had it, you know? And so a few things happened with this. One was 
I wrote it on the first night of the Bob Seger tour. It was so I would if I'm not on that tour, I never write it. Never, I'm not in that mood, you know. Two, uh, I, Reba McIntyre just recorded a song of of mine and Rafe's called Big Blue Sky, and she was the guest VJ when the song went number one on the on the video charts. Mm. And three, Taylor Swift said it was her favorite song in People Magazine, all in the same time frame, right? And then. To top it off, when I moved back to Greenville, I'm sitting here going, like, "Why did I? What did I just do? I moved back to Greenville. What am I doing?" I get a call, and it was Oprah's people saying it's going to be in the top things to buy at her Christmas, the whole album because of Sunshine. Yeah. So, it, once again, it's out of my control, right? All you can do is do the song, and all this other stuff will happen. But you still have to work your tail off. Well, you got to be in shape to climb that mountain, right? No, absolutely. So, I mean, it it it, uh, it serendipitous a little bit in terms of yes, it is. You know, you yes. for you for sure have to you have to put yourself out there, right? Right. And um, and by the way, I'm going to give you another nugget for another one of your lyrics. You know, down the road that you can think about, and you're up there on stage and in, in front of thousands of people. It's called the Summit Song. So in this case, we're going to use the Summit Song as sunshine because that is my Summit Song. Love and it. And I'd love to hear it from you. Okay, I'll play the verse of the chorus for you. So. Your dark hair draped across my pillow Says I finally got it right And as I watch you dream and twist it in the sheets I can't stop thinking about last night Well, I've waited so long so long, so long for someone like you. And as the morning breaks through the window pane, it reveals the truth that baby, you're my sunshine first light. Find your way to places that only no lights fail try blue skies with hardly time to hold on or be strong now I'm strong cause like the dawn you push it on away I tell you you're my sunshine everybody needs a little sunshine And it goes like that. Oh, it's so beautiful, man. It's just, <laughs> Thanks, man. You know, it's Thanks. just, yeah. I mean, I know you probably have hundreds of songs in the, in the can or in your head or, you know, ideas or whatever. But when something comes out and it's magical like that, it's just a gift. You know, you're giving a gift to the world. Well, and, you, Mark, you had to realize the biggest obstacle was it was the first time I had my own record label, right? So I've got my own record label and I've met this great man named Al Wisney and, uh, uh, somewhere in one of these celebrity golf tournaments, we became great friends and we started a label. He really helps get this label underway for me. So here we are competing against the monster, the big machines that I compete, that I used to be on. And all of a sudden the song was, you know, we got to somewhere in around 20, just ran, we just ran out of time, but the video goes number one and I'm getting calls from all these old record guys who are still running everything. Now I go, my gosh, you're doing this is impossible. And ends up being the, at the time, I think the number one most, uh, the number one highest charted song on Billboard to be a true independent record label. Mm. So, so we still fell a little short of our goal, uh, but but at the end of the day, man, it was fun battling because I loved it. You know, I knew I was driving my old record label guy crazy. I, it was it was that was my jab jabs back, you know. And so anyway, it's just just so funny. But it's uh, it that song was very important because without that song and all those things I went through, uh, we couldn't have had that that you know that feat. You know, it's sort of a feat in my life. Well, there's all these different Try signs, it. I think, that, that hit you along the way. And you just mentioned them, you know, Oprah and Taylor Swift and, and other people that, you know, were picking up your music. And, and, I, and I do believe in the, in the world of, of, of music that it's, it's so much of it is archived, right? And so, you know, people like I, I'm listening to songs and now my 18 year old daughter is listening to songs that I used to listen to back in the 70s. And we can do that because they're recorded and they're kept right. and, and whatnot. And so, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing to be able to continue to write songs, strike a chord in people. And then because of the song that maybe you, you, I'm sure you haven't even written yet, that's out there. 
that's going to pull people back into waiting on Joe and Sunshine and, and some of these other ones. Yeah, yeah. And, and the good news is I'm proud of that, those songs. So it's not like I wasn't myself at the time. I, was tr- I truly had to be, at that point in my life, it all had to be that. And, um, and so I have no, the good news is I like referring back to my, to the, to those years at 2000 on, because, you know, I mean, we've been told, I don't have to be me on Monday is in the top five most played songs since, since then on radio. That's crazy. And it would not it's been the size of six or seven number ones, but it never got to number one. It got to two. So it just shows you that, you know, it's just all that you draw upon. And then like where I am now is just so different, but it's not really, you know? So it's, I've been on this journey to, to really find myself. That's when moving back home, the only way to truly, to truly get to finally be me was nobody, I couldn't, I didn't need to co-write, I didn't need to write, you know, a lot of waiting on Joe and I wrote by myself, but, but, but you co-wrote a lot in Nashville. So you were still at the mercy of another opinion, right? Yep. Another soul. And when I moved here, it was all me. I was alone. And this is when moving back full circle, seeing your, your, your place that you grew up at home from a different viewpoint, you know? Uh, after living a lot of life, after failing a lot, succeeding, failing a lot, succeeding, uh, it, it all made sense. And now writing is, and it's just, a, it's, it's never a burden. It's an extreme joy. And, and I feel blessed to get to do it now more than I ever did. And it's, and I'm right on now, you know? What, what is that like? And, and I'm going to answer the question and then I, I want to give a statement. All right. So the question is, what is that like to be out on the road with a lot of these, these famous acts, right? You're talking about Bob Seger. You're talking about, um, Rascal Flatts. Um, Eric Church, some of these other ones. I think you've you opened for Garth Brooks at one point, right? So, I, I don't I don't know if I ever opened for Garth. I know Trish and I did some shows. Trish, so, yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I played with everybody. We yeah. played. We all played with everybody. Well, so for me, um, you, you know, that used to be like. Uh, you know, when I first got down to the LA Raiders, Jim Plunkett was the quarterback. I remember I was in the huddle and Jim Plunkett's in there and Marcus Allen's in there and Todd Christensen and <laughs> and you know Cliff Branch and we break the huddle and we go out and Howie twenty one. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Howie Long is the uh, the defensive yeah. lineman, and Matt Millen, and Lester Hayes, and it just you know Lyle Alzado. I mean, the the list went on and on and on. I was just like, I'm so privileged and grateful to be in this group of people of peers. I Man, I can only imagine because you you were a college kid, right? And all of a sudden you're there, correct? And I just saw these guys playing the Super Bowl two years. You're before. probably going like, oh my! God. I mean, and those guys are. Th- that was one of those teams where they were iconic. They're iconic. So, you're just in an iconic huddle. <laughs> you must have been like, oh, you, just, you probably just didn't need to look. Well, that's, I know <laughs> it's, it would be like you, well, you are doing this with That's my question. So what is that like for you when you get to go rub shoulders, you're talking, you're, you know, well, it's been so, I'm so, I'm so, uh, I'm so used to it now, but, uh, uh, it always feels humbling. And, and the only way I can explain it is, I don't know what it was like in the huddle, especially with football and knowing you had to have sort of this, really this mindset of being physical. Yep. So we don't have physicality in the music business. It's, you know, it's, I think it's more emotional only. So uh, the best way to explain it is everybody great that I've ever met in our business, they make you feel so at ease. They're extremely humble. And I don't know if they know that they deserve to be there. Hmm. Right. So they, they, you get that sense and they make you feel like you belong. And so there's never a point of like you feeling like you're with your idol at all. The point is that, hey, uh, welcome aboard. And they 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 love what, you, what 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 we do. You know, I love, love what I do. And that's the feeling I've got with all the best and the greatest. So my, my Bob Seger was the nicest guy in the world. His wife was fantastic. His daughter, Sam. I mean, they were well, we were together for, you know, se- seven months. And, and the bottom line was I got to know him re- really well and. And I, the only way I can explain it is extremely humble to be there is how Bob felt. It, felt. And I think that translates his music, and that's why his fans keep coming back, because he's that honest, you know? Well, that, I think that also, uh, you know, goes back to what you opened with about you and your wife creating this foundation. So right. you start to see success, you start to associate with other people who can affect change, who can help raise money. And then next thing, you know, you're having a golf tournament and you're having these wonderful people come yeah. in and join and you play and, you know, do, do all the things that you guys do. And that's just all part of giving back. So you're paying it forward. Right. Right. Well, well, it's, it's something you feel like at some point you have to do. And the funny thing was 
when we started to do it, we were spending so much time because it's a huge endeavor to put one on the success and getting a lot of our celebrity friends, you know, some, sometimes getting them to commit. Oh, we're coming, but then they had to fill out paperwork and all, you know, oh my God, who's coming and who's not. But they've been so supportive and uh, they come back every year and we've created this because of the community we're in. Like I said, everybody can't wait. And we're sort of like the unofficial like the big sponsors, you know, the CEO of UPS comes, the CEO of big pipeline company, the CEO, they're more CEOs than I can explain. They're coming in on their jets into Granville, Mississippi. And thank goodness that there was an air base here and that the, the runway's long enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and they're flying on their jets and they come here and they come early. And now celebrities like Reggie Smith, the great baseball uh, legend. Reggie's become one of my best friends. I was just with him and, and Reggie comes in and does a little baseball camp for the kids here. And, uh, and he comes in. He came in Tuesday this year and left on Monday. He didn't like to leave. They love it, him mm-hmm. and his wife. So they've become friends with all of my friends. And the friends that I've met, you know, the big sponsors that come in, like David Abney of UPS and all this, they all come in, right? My United Airlines friends, uh, uh, they all, all these guys come in and they are, uh, they all have become a family. So it's like a family reunion every year. So every year there may be some new, a new group. We had the, I I was a celebrity uh, uh, in the pairing with uh, Monday after the masters a couple years ago with a group of uh, Kentucky Wildcats, right? And they're decked out and I'm going, Hey, you guys do, you you guys Duke fans, right? Not new. They were Kentucky fans. (laughs) What? What did you say? And they were all doctors, right? One guy owned a bunch of convenience stores, but the rest of them were doctors and they were, those spouses were doctors and we had the best time. And all of a sudden, two years later, they come. And now we've become really good friends. And they've been added to our family. And they're going, like, we're never going to miss it. And they just love it. And this is what happens. And then they're helping us continue to grow the foundation. It's not like the great, the biggest event in the world where, you know, we're limited on how much money we can raise. But we're, it's been successful. And we're doing a lot for the kids. It, it, you can do a little bit in a lot of places down here and really affect children. And right now, it's just so important. Uh, we got Blue Cross on our team, and I just I met this one guy playing golf at the BMW. He was my one in our playing group six years ago for the first one, and he's become the biggest sponsor. It's just crazy. You meet people, and all of a sudden, they just feel like they want to give. You know? Yeah. yeah no. And, and I'm going that's, like that's it's the way it works. Unbelievable. Well, we're seeing that right now with with uh, the situation in Houston, right? Of course. And um, so it's just people want to get involved, and that's the human spirit coming alive. And then you yeah. you you put that synergy together, and you know, poof, you get an event, right. and then you start to help people, whether it's you know a dollar or a million dollars, it doesn't really matter. It's just one dollar more than they had before. You know, you decided to create this event. So, well, the uh, ultimate compliment for me the other day was this: we were filming part of our documentary, and I was with my oldest son, who's out in California in college. He's going to be a filmmaker. He's really talented, really amazing. And we were back there, and I was telling the story of me and Eugene Powell. This is how I learned how to. This is how I got hooked at ten years old behind my dad's liquor store, right? So my dad has the first legal liquor store in Mississippi. Truthfully, went to Notre Dame, went in the Air Force, and then he opens the first legal liquor store. I mean, how does that happen? And so. That is where I learned to do my thing. But I was out there. We were filming some of it for this film, right? That's coming out late fall. And he, this this guy walks out about 17 years old. And he walks out, African-American kid. And he goes, hey, I just wanted you to know that uh, that Eugene Powell used to come over and give us money. He used to talk about you. And he used to say that, you know, I know that you and him were friends. And he goes and starts arm rolling my tires on my car, right? And I'm going like, listen, hey, I, you don't need to do that. And he goes, no, no, I want to do it. And I said, listen, I, I had no money on me. We were there filming, right? Yeah. And I said, I don't have any money. He goes, Steve. He goes, oh, you're Mr. Azar. He goes, uh, you do so much for this community and so much of the people I know that every once in a while somebody needs to do something for you. He was a 17-year-old kid. And I was like, I looked at my son and I said, Okay, that's that's really one of the true purposes for him to appreciate it. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back. I was moved beyond belief because you just don't know. You know, you don't know what you, all of what's happening. And it's not just me. I'm obviously the figure point that you see. But like I said, it's this great community that's come together of friends and, and, and new friends and and that we're doing it. And it's affecting that kid so much that he feels like he needs to give back himself. I just thought that that was just one of the most memorable moments of my life. That's awesome. Well, I know you also have a heart for um, the American farmer. I also know you have a heart for our troops 
Um, oh yeah, sure. One of the songs that really moved me, um, again, another long line of, of tunes that, that you've come up with, um, is soldier song. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was hoping you could play just a couple of riffs. You know, there's yeah. a lot of things going on overseas right now and it's such a beautiful song and, and, um, you know, this world is crazy. And the one thing that I think sometimes sues us as a nation, as a, as a, as a world is the sound of music. It sounds yeah. like a song, right? And I, I, you know, when I when I heard this song again, I think you put it to a beautiful video and um, just you know, just great lyrics and great melody. This was so inspired by I, vis- I had made my first visit to Walter Reed, and there was a kid in there that was uh, that had lost his limbs. This oh. is in Dallas, Walter Reed, in in, in, in Washington D.C. Washington D.C. I'm sorry. So you know the the, uh, the you know the hospital for yeah. all the injured troops yeah, yeah. and soldiers and stuff, and so and his wife was with him, and they he probably was 19 or 20, right? So and she had a baby, and she's pushing the baby and pushing him, mm. right? And I walked out, out of there, and I was complaining because I, at that point I'd been on the road for like about three weeks. I hadn't been home, and I was just, you know, although I love being with my family. I hate being gone that long. I like just slipping in and out, uh, making sure I at least just get a, enough of a dose. And um, I was complaining at that point, right? And when I walked, I said, this, this kid has gone over, and he was gone for about a year. And right when he was about ready to come home, this happened, right? Mm. And I was going, it happened in Iraq, and I go, Oh my God. So he hit me. So I walk on the bus and I just start. Your soldiers finally coming home to you and the kids, the life I missed. To no more nights alone. No more. To my little boy's last baseball game. To my baby girl's first school day. I swear I'll never miss church as long as I live. And I know it's late Please pick up the phone Cause your soldiers finally come I hope and pray when you got lonely You thought of me and you got proud I can't believe a year's gone by And all I've done is fight Oh, I can't wait to come back home and put away my gun Do nothing but love Start again If we can Where it was So I started thinking about that Obviously I hadn't played in a long time And I was stumbling through the guitar But that's alright, I'm human And uh, I can handle making mistakes But but just walking out of there And getting on the bus in the very back of it um, It just fell out, man I just, just it, that was that was a, such a reality check And one that I wish I'd have never gotten You know? Yeah, no. Hey, listen, I was down in um, uh, Tanzania this last year with Chris Long of the now uh, right. Philly um, Philadelphia Eagles. Right. We're down there with probably six uh, NFL players and then a bunch of Green Berets. And three of the uh, uh, the, the folks down there were, um, two were amputees and one was blind. And uh, we all climbed, got to the top of the mountain. Jim Moore was with us. And yeah, I don't know, it just you know, being around there and the sacrifice that they give to our country. Mm-hmm. It's just such a, an amazing thing. And again, it just puts whatever situation you think you may be in and just reduces it down <laughs> yeah. to like, I haven't done anything. Right. And, yeah, I don't know. No. It reduces it down to the very, just the, the bottom, you know, and you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So let's move forward. And, okay. and, and, and I want to get into kind of the, uh, the kind of where you are at today. And it's something right. that's really super cool. I want you to give this a little bit of a setup. So now you move back to Greenville. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Greenville, Mississippi. Right. And, um, and so there, there's a, I know there's a history uh, around down by the liquor store and whatnot. Um, but you came up with a, just a beautiful song. Um, there's something in the water, right. And, but well, but, the, the, movie, the, the film is actually called something in the water. The documentary of us getting together together in this old blues club called Club Ebony in Indianola. So you're going to see us coming together, these guys, five of B.B. King's guys, one of Elvis's and one of Lil Milton's. The name of the album is called Down at the Liquor Store. So everybody goes, I, I know it's so confusing sometimes, but they're both synonymous with each other. And so uh, the album's out now, but it's Down at the Liquor Store. Yeah, so it's Steve Azar and the Kingsman. Right. And the King's Men. And, right. and, the, and the King's Men are this collection of guys who used to play with B.B. King and Elvis and others. Correct. Right. Little Milton. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
So tell me about how that got together and where you recorded this and there's some historic value to, to what you yeah. did. Correct. Uh, right. So I had, when I first came back home, I was asked to, to start a music festival and I had a farmer buddy of mine that I'd gotten to know. And so we started the mighty Mississippi music festival. And what it's done is it's, you know, it was on the banks of the river. It's sort of a mini Bonnaroo meets jazz fest, which you're used to, you know, obviously no jazz fest. And, mm-hmm. and also, but it's our own version. It's very Mississippi Delta, very, very authentic uh, in every way. And obviously the, the blues was created down here. The Delta blues is the beginning of, of it all. It's the, you know, it's the centerpiece of all popular genres of music just about uh, commercial wise. And so we wanted to celebrate that and all that. Well, what happens is I'm back home and, and I start getting asked to play the Delta Blues Festival. And, and then I got asked to play BB had passed away. And it was the first year and they said they wanted Kevmo and myself to headline his first um, homecoming festival in Indianola, Mississippi, that he wasn't going to be at because he just passed. Right. So I was so humble, you know, and I'm going like, and then I was, I had just finished writing this record. So during this five and six year process, I was writing a record. I didn't even know I was writing. I mean, if you asked me, did I have any songs that I written? I'd have said, okay, I probably have a couple. Well, I'd written like 20 and I didn't even know it. So I, I just wasn't doing the math, you know, um, I'd asked, I'd been asked in, during this period to write the world ski championships official song, which, uh, is called fly. And I wrote that and went and performed it. Uh, in Vail a couple years ago, 2015. And then I, uh, that song ended up being in Kevin James's feature track to Mall Cop 2, right? Great, great song. And, yeah, and so I did that. And then the Delta Soul record, which was before this new record, was me really trying to make my way, a record about Mississippi, but I still wrote most of it when I was in Nashville. So I've got one foot in Nashville and my mind is in Mississippi, but, and it, I loved that record. I loved it. But, uh, I was making my way to have both feet on Mississippi soil, and I had to write this new record and to be worthy of recording with these icons that I grew up loving and my parents grew up loving uh, with their bandmates, right? And so uh, born from this was uh, was this conversation that my manager, Aaron, had with the head director of the B.B. King Blues Museum. He goes... They just started talking about what if Steve would make his new record in Club Ebony, which was 1948. The club was founded by an African-American gentleman who the Chitlin circuit played there. Um, uh, Just there's such a history. And B.B. came back and bought it, bought it. He had married uh, his his second wife's mom owned it after she'd been uh, his his wife, second wife, mom was the second owner. Okay, she owned a place called Ruby's Night Spot in Leland, Mississippi, and she bought Club Ebony midway through the thing. And BB fell in love with with her with Sue Evans, and and the next thing they know, they're you know they're they're married. But he ended up late in his life buying this club, so it's part of this museum, right? The BB King Blues Museum. You go and it's it's authentic. I mean, you feel the spirit in the room. It's amazing, and we turned it into a recording studio, which had never been done. And we got all the guys together. Most of these guys I just met. Elvis's guy turned me down on every record I ever asked him to play. Yep. And named David Briggs. He's played on 1,000 number one records. He was the original Muscle Shows cat. 1,000. He had Beatles, played with the Beatles, played with, you know, BB. And, but Elvis, he was Elvis's guy. I mean, he used to go do the peanut butter and banana sandwiches in Denver with Elvis. This is how close he was. And so when he heard what I'd played, what I'd wrote, written at home, I sent it to him. He goes, hey, now we're talking. I'm, where are we going to record? I said, well, here's the other catch. It's in Indianola, Mississippi. He goes, when, when do I get there? So he wouldn't record with me in Nashville when I was there, but he recorded this, which let me know that I needed both feet in the Delta. And he was finally moved by the whole thing with me. Yeah. Um, so we got together. We filmed it all. My son, who's a senior at, at Chapman University, he's using an alias name. I can't know a coffee or something like that. Because he said, Dad, my first feature cannot be you can't tell me what what my first kiss is, right? So I'm going to do this for you. And he, he edited and colored it and all that. But and he's just finishing it. But uh, uh, he did it. I put it. I, it was basically breaking every child labor law there was because he, he is. And he's got way more talent than me. So when I tell you this kid is a Cohen brother's mind in his own way, is very this humor and this he's very just intellectual, but he, he's funny and witty. When I tell you he's going to be special, he's special. So he did me a big favor by taking 400 hours of footage and going through it and then going to film this other stuff. And 
the Delta had seeped in him so much. He had had so much cool success late in his high school years with the Delta being and the characters of the Delta being his his on his canvas that he would paint. He knew exactly what to do with this. And so he turned it into a film that lets you get to know all of these players. It's not some music video. You get the music, but it's learning about the history and uh, and and how we're coming together and literally having to be it. You cannot make a record together like this without really truly falling in love with each other. You, it's got to be a love story at the end of the day. And we had to stumble through this. So we did, and you see it, and you see us go from not knowing each other to absolutely loving each other. And then this record was born. Uh, that's awesome. So there's what, 12 tracks on this? 13 tracks. 13 tracks. What is your favorite track? Then I, they're not, there's nothing. I think I love. Okay. So I mean, let me ask you a different question. Then. What, it's like, I say, which one's my favorite child? Well, you know? wait, that's okay. I understand that. So <laughs> will you present one of your favorite childs to the table right now? Yeah. 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 And so look, so this is, well, this, the re- record does not ever happen if I don't write this song, I really believe this sort of got me going without me knowing, obviously. And uh, how could I not write this song as a kid? Because when I came back, all the memories that were so visual in my growing up was in this song. And so I'm going like, how could I not do it? So it goes a little like this. Down, 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 down at the liquor store, shorty used to sweep the floor. You to dip that cheap cigar and walk your whiskey to the car. You dust off every bottle until each one shines. I still recall his small bald head and his big white buckshot knife. Johnny Lee was short his wife. She raised me most of my life. So proudly kept and clean the house in that store bought cotton blouse, did bit of carrot snuff, sang about Jesus' love, tap her feet to my guitar, out of time just like I was. Well, she'd stop by the liquor store every afternoon, a quarter to four, toting her pocketbook and bread dollar store sack, a quarter coke, a slit six pack, and give a shorty one of those Johnny Lee looks at. Hmm, I am headed on to cook for your up teen kids in my section eight house. I hear you bugs getting out of jail. It's tears and tobacco dripping off her mouth. Keep it going, keep it going. Oh, some wild Irish rose I built a king cool Sonny boy would play the blues Behind the liquor store he'd sing So much hurt spilling out of those strings Eyes stained cataracts A heart full of heart attacks His mansion made a shotgun shack Nearly 90 years of not looking back And it goes on Wow, so beautiful <laughs> Uh, but the funny thing is, all those pictures were the only things I ever saw growing up. And how come it takes me forty years to to write it? Because there's a know, process. Years. Yeah. But man, what a process! That's thus the slow learner that I am. The mutt. I'm such a mutt. Oh, uh, the, <laughs> the journey is the destination, right? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what it's about. And so, so hey, Steve, this has just been magical. It's been incredible. It's been so much fun to get caught up with you again. Um, you, where can people find you? Well, steveazar.com, you can get sick of all my music and everything, but Steve Azar and the Kingsmen, which is K-I-N-G-S-M-E-N, is the new site. You can see the trailers for the film. You can really get into this project, and the album came out August 11th. We had a couple hot tracks on iTunes for a couple weeks, including down at the liquor store. Um, I mean, this record, to me, is everything I dreamed of making. Um, it's a lot of fun, the record. It's It's got you know, songs I feel like that... Uh, I, I just can't tell you. I just, this is the biggest piece of me that, that anybody will ever get at this point. I mean, I'm just, I'm really excited about this project in general. And uh, so I would love people just to stream it. You know, you go stream it. You're, you're doing, that's the way things are now. Uh, but that would be good enough for me. I just want you to have it and give it a shot. Now that's great. And so are you guys going to go out on tour? 
Yeah, we hope to be touring. We're, we've got shows. We've done a, a series of bicentennial shows. We headlined Mississippi Night at the Grammys in February this this past year, uh, past February. We're doing the last bicentennial. Uh, and we're celebrating our 200th birthday, obviously, in Mississippi. So de- in December at night in Jackson in the cold, hopefully we're going to we're gonna do that. And then we're just working on uh, touring. And I have a feeling this band's going to need to tour a lot overseas. Uh, the blues, and although this record obviously has blues stained all over it, it's still my writing with the way we all played together. So it's like a sound that you've never heard. And uh, and uh, so the, this world is, this kind of music is big in so many other places besides the United States. So I have a feeling we're going to end up needing to uh, to do that. Walter King, who played the, the Angels of Harlem on YouTube, mm. he's in the band. Elvis's guy, uh, Randy Jackson's brother Herman. I mean, the list goes on and on. This is a crazy band, man. And so, uh, sounds like fun. Couple, it, you know, it sounds like a great locker room you put together. Oh, it is a good locker. It's a good huddle and good locker room. Yeah, good guys. Yeah, that, that's incredible. So, what my what my hope is, what my goal is, I really do want to come out and see you and see this band and see these new Absolutely. songs and and listen to some of the old stuff, maybe. But, um, wow, what an inspiring podcast to do with you. And, you know, one of my takeaways was we heard a lot of beautiful songs, but we're also, we're talking about how, you know, you went through these, these difficult periods of time in your life where you were about to give up and you didn't, you kept, you kept the journey going and just, you know, kind of something happened and then something happened and something happened. And, you know, next thing you know, you wake up and here you are today. Well, I mean, hey, Mark, you got it. You get it. I mean, we all have our obstacles, uh, whether they're personal relationships or with me, obviously, musical has been personal with you. Football is personal. Um, and, and, and we, we want to hold on to some of those things. Um, the only difference is with you and me is you don't need to get hit anymore and, uh, or hit anybody or, you know, you know, and, and so you're chasing a different, you're, you're, you know, you're climbing a different mountain literally. And I just love what you're doing. It's so inspiring. And, um, I'm going to become a fan of your, of your podcast. I mean, to me, it's very important that people get a chance to understand uh, what you've gone through and your guests. And so I'm so excited about this. And, uh, anyway, so it's just, you know, it's, it's, we're at a point in our lives where uh, we want to, we really want to take advantage of, uh, uh, why our minds are still strong and our bodies strong enough to, to keep going, you know? So it's yeah. a blessing. Well, you know, I, I get so much value out of, of talking to these different people and hearing their stories and everybody's story is so much different and unique. And, uh, some people I know, some people I don't know, some people I, I haven't talked to in a long time, like you, uh, right. but at the end of the it. day, it's just, it's just fun to hear their story. And it's just a story of, of really, um, determination and, and, uh, getting to that end game. And, and, you know, again, it's, I don't think it's actually, it's ever an end game. It's, it's, it it continues to go on and you're going to come, you're going to get to the end of this road to a certain point with these guys. And then you're going to your, your, your greatest work I'm sure is still ahead of you. I hope so. I've already believed I'm deep into my next record writing and I'm just so fired up about it. I mean, I'm at a place right now that I just wish I could explain, but, uh, you know, I think when you have kids, I mean, you know, I used to go, oh, my God, that artist is getting soft and he's losing his edge. Man, I've got, when I had kids, when when I had kids, I got my edge. You know what I mean? And so and I found myself and they continue to push me yeah. like my oldest son. Oh, dad, you're better than that. And I go, what? And he goes, you should go listen to what you're writing. And then I'd go and I'll fight. I mean, it's amazing how inspirational they become for us. And so now it's just reversed. You know, although I like to give the locker room talk to them all the time and I'm known for that, you know, they're like, oh, my God, here it comes. Right. Because I can't help it. Right. And my my famous quote to them every time they're leaving is head on a swivel. Right. So I'm so used to this stuff that you and I both, you know, grew up around you, obviously, at a different level. But I I use those old sports uh, terminologies because it's the only way I can relate, you know, and so I drive my kids crazy. But now it's reversed and now they're inspiring to me. And I found my, I, I found myself because of it. Well, the thing I say to my kids every day, uh, literally every day and every single time yeah. I say this, they roll their eyes is it takes yeah. a little more to make a champion. That's and right. You, and you think about that. And if you want to achieve greatness, you got to go that extra mile, right? Yeah, you do. You do. You have to work harder than the person behind. you have to. You, you have to, if you, that's yeah. where you want to go. Well, listen, hey, Steve, thank you so much. Blessing, you're a rock buddy. star, you're thank a country you. star, you're just a, a star of a person. And um, I just, again, really appreciate with tremendous amounts of gratitude, you did this me podcast too, with me, okay? I love it. It's been incredibly, uh, it's just been great catching up and I love you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey, this is Mark, and thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast this week. We had another great guest, and it is so awesome to continually have these different people on, talk about their different adversity, how they've overcome that, um, and what they've done to affect change in their life to become very successful. So, you know, really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. So, uh, as always, we love the rating and reviews that you guys do on iTunes. If you haven't done that, please go do that. It really helps us in terms of uh, increasing our visibility within uh, Apple, iTunes. And um, anyways, it's just fun to share the love and uh, what these different stories, these different people are, are all about. So make sure you tune in next week. We appreciate it. And that's it. Bye.